I just have a, a huge beaker of water, and you can do this at home too, huge container of uh, water, and then Pepsi, love Pepsi, okay, I should get money for showing up right now, okay, and then uh, back to okay, all right, we're going to play the game, we'll float, all right, Diet Pepsi, what do you think? Okay, let's we'll see. Looks like that Pepsi floats. Pepsi. Oh. So I guess that Pepsi is actually lighter and better for you. <laughs> Why do you think the difference is? What do you think the difference is? It's it's the sugar additive is usually what Alice explained, whereas. Uh, sugar, artificial sugars tend to have a high, what's called sweetness factor, that's real. And the sweetness factor makes it, uh, you can, the sugar pretty dense. And you don't have to add as much though. Uh, and because you don't have to add as much, uh, because there's so much sweetness in it, uh, you can have a slightly lighter. Uh, actual sugar is not as sweet as some of the artificial ones, so you have to add more. <coughs> making it overall more dense. And this should, uh, it's kind of fun, you can try different drinks and see which one flows and which one doesn't. Um, I just happen to have Pepsi, so I tried that. You can do it at home with your little cousin, see if they can guess it. Then you can tell them stuff, science stuff. Okay. Oh, by the way, somebody found a check. This is awesome, okay? A check here. I will go cash this later unless you think you lost it. Okay? This is awesome. But it's a UC Davis check. So if you need if you need more money, uh, it's right here. Okay. Check four. Chemical reaction. This is kind of need of chemistry. Uh Some degree, 
but the next ones we'll see to increase in amount. So we'll see quite a bit more of the following, the single replacement. This happens in the dorms all the time. You have uh, A, and we got a BZ. <laughs> He's not cutting it, gets bumped out, no more BZ anymore. <laughs> A is in elemental form. Do you remember that? That's when the element is by itself, like H2 or N2 or just iron, things like that. So elemental form for A. This entity is ionic or it could be a strong acid or it could be a strong base. Okay, any of those. Uh, by the way, A and B, oh, I said that, again, uh, elemental form. Okay, what we'll see even more of is the double replacement, even more exciting. Okay, AX and BZ, they go out on a double date and they realize they have the wrong partners. <laughs> Okay, so they both switch partners. It's called a double replacement. Super common reaction in chemistry. Uh, both reactants are typically ionic. Okay? In fact, almost everything is usually ionic. It doesn't have to be. Uh, other possibilities, both of these, one could be a strong acid, the other could be a strong base. Or one an acid, another strong base. I have a combination of something strong like acid or base or an ionic compound. And then the fifth one we've already seen, combustion. And just to remind you, that's an organic plus oxygen goes to CO2 plus water. Okay? Those are the five types of reactions at this point you want to be familiar with. In fact, these really badly come back to haunt you in Chem 2C. If you go into Chem 2C, you're going to learn a lot of uh, reactions. They're usually some type of reaction like one of these. Okay? There will be actually one more reaction we'll learn later when we get to the next chapter. Know these reactions though, know how to classify them. And you also have to know how to write the products, which we'll have some practice doing. Okay, before we get there though, I want to say a little bit about balancing. So officially, you're learning balancing now, though I kind of assume you already know how to balance reactions. So given something like this, what kind of reaction would this be? Combination reaction. Two things are combining to a single final product. I'm assuming you can balance something like this within maybe about 30 seconds or so. Okay? Do that. So make sure you bal uh, can balance. I usually, just as a couple recommendations, and these recommendations are at the bottom of page 25. Start with uh, compounds first. So the kind of messiest looking thing and the thing with the most subscripts that are not one. Okay, so the one with the most subscripts is usually where I'd start. So I'd usually start here in this example. I'd leave, again, those in elemental form all by themselves. Uh, or I'd leave them until last. Usually. And then if you happen to have a polyatomic, I'd balance that as a unit if it remains unchanged. So like a phosphate, you see in the reactor the products, I'd balance that phosphate. Okay, two here, so we need two phosphates over on the other side. You can use fractions while you're doing your work, but in this class in particular, your final answer must be reported as a whole number. Okay? So I want on exam, final answer, whole numbers. Okay? So no fractions then. Later in other classes, you'll see the use of fractions, uh, but we're not going to get into it. And then finally, uh, check your answer at the end. So four aluminums, two times two, four aluminums. 3 times 2, 6 oxygens, 2 times 3, 6 oxygens. So, you always check your answer at the end. You always know if you're going to be right. Let's try it. Try a couple examples. Yeah. 
That's good, yeah. Uh, on an exam, you need to factor it down to, what would that be called? It's lowest common factor. Yeah, so it should be factored down. So the previous aluminum one, you shouldn't write 8, 6, and 4. That wouldn't be accepted as correct. So factor down, but only down to whole numbers. Good. Okay, let's try this. First one, what category is this? This is classified as a combination. You're combining copper and oxygen. And if you wrote the product, then you should be able to do this. This would be a common type of question. Get this. Uh, now, copper has two oxidation states. What are they again? It could be plus one or plus two. I noted I chose which one here? Plus two. You always, when you're oxidizing something, you always want to pick the highest number. So 2 over 1, 3 over 2, etc. So this is copper uh, 2 oxide or cupric oxide is the answer. And then you'd want to be able to balance this, which would be, uh, let's see, if we put a 2 here and 2 here to balance the oxygen, that would work. OK. For the next one, what kind of reaction is this one? Classify it. It's going to be a double replacement. How did we know that? There's two ionic compounds in the reactants. Two ionic compounds, it has to be a double replacement. So you're going to swap both of them. So let's do that. Now, instead of sodium chromate, it's barium chromate. Instead of barium chloride, it's sodium chloride. Make sure you get the subscripts right. Okay? And then let's try and balance this. So here, they all look kind of ugly. I'll probably start with this sodium chromate. It has the most subscripts. Two sodiums, two sodiums. A one chromate, one chromate. Two chlorines, two chlorines. Uh, oh, there really is two chlorines there. So that might be it. That looks good. OK, let's try the next. Scoot it up for you. What category is this last reaction? This is a single replacement. How to know that? Well, the first one is a lone element, aluminum, plus an ionic. That's a textbook single replacement kind of reaction. Your standard single replacement. So what you're going to do is put the manganese by itself and put the aluminum with the sulfate. So let's do that. There's aluminum sulfate. And then the manganese is all by itself. Don't worry about the state symbols at this point. We're going to talk about state symbols in the next chapter. Okay, so we've got, let's balance this. This looks like the ugliest with the subscripts. So two aluminums, two aluminums, three sulfates, so three sulfates. And then we need three manganese. So you don't have to be able to balance as fast as I am. But I'm assuming you can balance a, a standard reaction in about 30 seconds or so. By the time you get to the test. Uh, we, I'll usually, I'll give you a little hint on the example. I typically put one pretty tough balancing example on the test. I usually save that one to last. Uh, that one could take you about five minutes sometimes or more. Okay? Uh, we'll do an example of one tough one next time. But otherwise, you can see the kind of tough ones I have if you just look on the uh, practice exams. Got a lot of balancing practice. Some of those are tough if you want to watch those YouTube videos. So balancing one, two, three, four, five. And then a combination, combustion reaction balancing, which is a little tough, or pretty tough. That's about it that I'm going to say for section one. We're going to move to 4.2, which is page 20. Oh, sorry, I thought the banana guy was back here. Okay. Uh, 4.2 is page 26 of the reader, and we're going to page 118 of the textbook. This. Okay. 
two equations and oops, and sodium. So by equations I mean reactions and stoichiometry. Uh, stoic is from the Greek meaning element, and then the suffix uh, is from measurement. So it means measure of the elements, or it's essentially stoichiometry stands for calculations we do regarding a reaction. Okay, and you'll see, and you've probably uh, have done some of these if you've taken high school chemistry. All right, so let me write down a reaction. N2, and leave some space here, H2. Notice that sometimes I re we write reactions with double-headed arrows, meaning it can go forward or reverse. Now, this can mean a couple different things. Let's get two different colors out. Uh, let's balance it. We can do, we'll do a one here. Usually don't write the one, but for this illustration, I'll write it. A three here and a two there. Now, what does that one, three, and two mean? It could mean molecule. So one molecule of N2 and three molecules of H2 react to form two molecules of NH3 in the forward direction. But it can also mean one mole of N2 with three moles of H2 react to form two moles of NH3. If you're talking about molecules, you're talking about a microscopic look at the reaction, okay, a small look. If you're talking about moles, we're talking about a big, zoomed out look, macroscopic for moles. Most of the time in our class, we're going to be talking macroscopic or moles, large, relatively large amounts. Amounts that you can potentially see with your eye. Okay? So, how do you do these calculations? Well, uh, you need to be able to do these uh, two calculations here. There's something you need to know called molar ratio. And I'll say a little bit about it. Molar ratio means that the ratio of the moles in particular uh, can be taken between any two compounds or species within the reaction. So for example, you can say there's one mole of N2 for every two moles of NH3. Or, you could say, uh, there's two moles of NH3 for three moles of H2. Any combination you can possibly think of. Uh, three moles of H2 for every one mole of N2. Any combination works as what's called a molar ratio. Why this is helpful is it helps us convert from moles of one compound to moles of another. And this allows us to do a lot of possible calculations. Let me show you how. On this slide, and this, what I'm going to show you is not in the book, but it is in the reader on page 27 at the top. Uh, it's also posted on smart site. I'm going to show you half of the picture first. The first half of the budget. Let's say we're talking about compound A. Okay? If I know the moles of compound A, as you learned in chapter 2, you can use alphabetic numbers to convert to atoms and molecules. You can also go to moles using mm, molar mass. Go up to mass, or you can convert to mass to volume using the density. So this is all kind of chapter two stuff. What the molar ratio adds is possible stoichiometric calculations between two uh, species in a reaction. So now I can convert between A and B using a molar ratio, I go from mole to mole. I call this the molar express. Okay? You can take a ticket and go from one to the other. Uh, B, you know, it's just a copy of A, but to go from A to B, uh, you need a molar ratio. So that's what the molar ratio is about, and uh, that's what stoichiometry is all about. So we'll do an example so you can see how this works. This one, and it's a different slide. So for the above reaction, 1.78 grams of HGI2 
is she actually really is the same one? Okay, mercury 2 iodide or mercuric iodide? It's a ionic compound. Uh, so, uh, mercuric iodide is formed. Find the initial amount of potassium iodide in the reactants. Okay, so when you're doing stoichiometry, what I always recommend is write out the reaction first. So Ki, potassium iodide, plus mercury 2 nitrate, or mercuric nitrate. What kind of reaction is this, by the way? This will be a double replacement. We have the ionic with another ion. So we'll go potassium nitrate, they switch ions, remember, and uh, mercuric iodine. So there's my double replacement reaction. As time goes on, try to get more familiar with writing these, so you'll need to do this on the exam. Now, underneath, I write down what I'm given. So I'm given 1.78 grams of this, and I write down what I want. I want the initial amount or mass of potassium iodide. Okay? So I'm going to start with what I have and go to what I know. Uh, let me explain that in two ways. First, visually, I'm going to move this for a moment. Visually, what I'm going to do, I have the mass of the products. I'm going to convert that to moles. I'm going to use a molar ratio to go to moles of the reactant. And I'm going to use the molar mass to go to mass. So I'm going to go in this path right here. Okay? That's the global kind of picture. Uh, and another way to explain what I'm going to do here is when you're doing stoichiometry, and I'll kind of do this as scratch right here in brown. Uh, step one is convert the given, convert given to moles. So whatever units you're given, go to moles. Step two, you're always going to use a molar ratio, which you saw on the Molar Express. And then step three, convert uh, to requested variable. Okay? So really in stoichiometry, you're always going to have these three steps. Whether you visualize this through the molar express or you like to look at these three steps, it doesn't matter. You're always going to convert to moles, use the molar ratio, then to convert to what you're asked for. So let's try it with our problem right here. Step one, we're going to start with what I have, 1.78 grams of the mercuric iodide, uh, HgI2. Okay, then molar ratio to get the moles. So let's go to moles, and from the periodic table, it's 454.39 grams. Now I'm at moles, I've done step one. Now I'm going to use a molar ratio. What do I need to do before I do that, though? Oh, shoot, I'm going to balance this craziness. I think you can do it with two iodines there and two of those. Okay, so there's two moles of what I want on top, Ki. The two come from the coefficient two for every one mole of the HGI2, because there's one for the coefficient of HGI2. Now I use my molar ratio. My final step is to convert to the requested variable, which is mass or grams. And so I'm going to use the molar mass to do that. Uh, for Ki, it's 166.00 grams per mole from the periodic table. And that leaves me with 1.30 grams of Ki. <coughs> That's a pretty standard question whenever you're doing stoichiometry. In the next lecture, we'll do a different one. There's that one. Any questions? Okay. That's all there is to section two. We're going to go on now to section three, which is page 27 of the reader, or 125 of the textbook. Remember that we're going faster on the easier chapters and slower on the harder chapters. 
you probably can't tell, we slightly slowed down, but barely for this chapter. Chapters, the next couple chapters, five, really six and seven, that's when we'll really slow down. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Section three. Reactions in solution. Okay, most reactions we're going to do, uh, it's in the category called wet chemistry, or that means it's happening in solution. It's aqueous, it's in water. And solution means that you have solute and solvent. So solute plus solvent makes a solution. The solute is what there is less of. The solvent is what there is more of. So the solvent, typically for us, will be water. Okay? And the solute could be a number of things. It could be a liquid. It could really be any phase. And so to write, let's say, uh, the solvent is water, for example, and the solute is uh, salt, sodium chloride, then how you could write that chemically is NaCl, and you just put Aq after it. Aq means aqueous, or means this entity, this species, is dissolved in water. It is, again, dissolved in water. So, because we're working with solutions, we need a method of measurement, and so we use something called concentration. How concentrated uh, is this solute in the solution? And there's a lot of concentration units. Technically, actually learn one without knowing it. The percent mass is a concentration unit, but the main one that we focus on will be uh, called molarity, capital M. That's the symbol for molarity. Molarity is moles of solute per liter of solution. Moles of solute per liter of solution. It can't be per milliliter, it has to be per liter. Okay, so it's amount per volume, really. And so you would write moles per liter as the units, or you could just write capital M as the units. What kind of joy does this give us in the Molar Express? We have just built a new route. That route is right here. Now we can go between moles and volume as a conversion because we have molarity as moles per liter. So if I know moles, I can get volume. So it's another way to get to volume. Uh, and specifically, if you don't have density, it's the only way to get to volume. This is also in your, uh, on Smart Site and in your reader on page 27. So I'm not going to give this to you on the exam, but I just want to give you kind of a bigger picture of how to go where and how things are connected. Okay, in this chapter, no, in this section really, there's three types of molarity problems that I want to point out to you. Okay? Three types of molarity problems. You need to be able to recognize which one we're looking at so you solve it in the appropriate manner. So I want to show you this before we do examples. So you can see the types of molarity problems. Type one, unit conversion. Okay? A unit conversion is, the, you know it's this type of problem when you have one compound, okay, one compound, and you're going to use the molar express to do it. You're essentially converting between volume and moles, or liters and moles. And so you're using molarity as a conversion. So molarity is being used as a conversion. That's the first type of molarity problem. The second type is called dilution. Okay? You might even see the word dilution in the problem. This also is one compound, so it's similar to unit conversions, but there is a difference. You're going to see molarity and volume change. So molarity and volume will change, but something that won't change is moles. There is a formula for this. It's M1V1 equals M2V2. 
The one represents initial molarity and volume. The two represents final molarity and volume. Okay? So if you know the initial molarity and volume, uh, and one of these three won't be given, one of those four variables won't be given. If you know three out of the four, it's just plug and shove to find the uh, unknown. So say you know the initial molarity and volume, and you know the final volume, you can find the final molarity. Uh, moles are unchanged on both sides, and that's why you can set the initial and final state. Uh, the third type, so the way, again, you're going to tell the difference between the first two is because molarity and volume change in the dilution example. The third type is called stoichiometry or titration. Stoichiometry or titration. Stoichiometry, the thing we just did. How are you going to know is this kind of problem. You're going to see multiple compounds in a reaction. So specifically, a reaction is what you're going to see, and the question will be focused around the reaction. As opposed to the first two, the question is focused about a particular compound. There could be more compounds in the question, but if it's focused on a particular compound, it's the first or second one. The third one is focused on reaction, so multiple compounds are the focus. And the key is to find moles, or essentially stoichiometry. Step one, convert to moles. Step two, molar ratio. Step three, convert to what they ask you for. Just through geometry. The only difference you're going to see here is that they're going to use molarity now. That's it. Okay, so molarity will be a factor in, the, in the new, these new kinds of geometry problems. There's really two types if you're interested. You don't necessarily need to know this, but if you're interested to know, the two types are one type of stoichiometry is that you're going to use molarity as a conversion in your calculation. And the second type is that you're going to solve for molarity. So you need to find mol moles and volume, divide the two to get molarity. So those are the two types you'll generally see when you're doing a stoichiometry or titration problem of this type that involves molarity. So those are the three types. Make sure you can tell the difference, number one. And then number two, of course, know how to solve it. All right. Uh, so, of course, we have a bunch of examples to try because we need to see how to do this craziness. Uh, and all this list is in your reader if you want to refer to on page 28. The book, unfortunately, doesn't, it does all these examples, but it just doesn't designate the differences between all these kinds. This one. These are going to be all pretty typical problems. Okay, on uh, this case, sulfuric acid, there's only one compound. This cannot be a stoichiometry problem. Okay, second, uh, molarity and volume are not changing. Uh, in that case, this is a unit conversion problem. So that's how I know I'm going to do conversions to solve this problem. And I, I want to know the mass, and I'm starting out with volume and molarity, okay? So, start with what you know. There's volume. Let's change this to liters, because remember, molarity is in liters. So 1,000 milliliters per liter. So now it's in liters. Now I can uh, kind of, I'm using my molar express to go to where I want. I'm trying to get to mass. I need to go to moles first. So I have 6.00 moles per liter, which is molarity. Notice that the milliliters are gone. The liters have canceled. I'm left with moles right now. I need to go to mass. So there's one more step. 98.09 grams per mole from the periodic table. This will cause the moles to drop out now. And I'm left with grams, which is what I was requested. This is merely a unit conversion problem. I just need to convert to the units they ask for. 29.4 grams of H2SO4. Is it okay that I only use three sig figs here? I've got four sig figs here from the periodic table. I've got three here. I've got three here. How many do I have here? It is an exact number. So it is infinite, okay? so it's unlimited sig figs here. 
Okay? So, three is the correct answer for St. Figs. And that's that one. That one's done already. Let's try another one. Try this craziness right here. silver one nitrate, or technically you could just write silver nitrate, 
Uh, but anyways, if the molarity of aluminum bromide is 0.1 molar, how much silver bromide is produced in grams? Okay, notice here we've got a bunch of compounds we're working with. It looks like they react. We're talking stoichiometry here. Okay? Multiple compounds we're working with. Uh, it looks like a reaction. So we're talking stoichiometry in this example. When you're doing stoichiometry, always write out the reaction first. So aluminum bromide, make sure you can get these subscripts right. Okay, Three bromines, because aluminum is plus three. Aluminum bromide reacts with silver nitrate. Well, silver is plus one, nitrate is minus one. What kind of reaction will this be? Two ionic compounds, this is a double replacement. So the silver will go with the bromide uh, to make silver one bromide, and the uh, aluminum will go with the nitrate. That makes just merely aluminum nitrate. Uh, aluminum plus three, so make sure you have that three sub subscript after the nitrate. I also like to write down what I know and what I'm asked for. So there's uh, aluminum bromide that's over here, 37.5 milliliters. Uh, aluminum bromide is 0 0.100 molar. And I want to know how much silver bromide over here is produced in grams. So mass of this. This is merely stoichiometry. I'm going to take this, convert to moles, molar ratio, and then step three, convert to mass. Make sure you balance first. So balance this. I need three nitrates. That makes me have three silvers. That'll do it. Okay, so start with what you know. That's the 37.5 milliliters. I'm going to have to end up converting this to moles. That's my first step of stoichiometry. But I want it to be in liters first. Again, we're not doing a comparison here. This is not dilution, so you need the right units here. Liters first, then when I multiply by the molarity, moles per liter, now I cancel out the milliliters, I cancel out the liters, I'm left with moles. <laughs> Step one done. Step two, I uh, molar ratio. Uh, I want the three moles of AGBr on top, and I'm getting rid of the one mole of the aluminum bromide on the bottom. Uh, one more step, I'll take it over to the next line. Times. Uh, I need to now go to what they asked for. They asked for grams, so I'm going to use the periodic table, 187.77 grams per mole for the uh, silver bromide. And now the moles are also canceling out. And I'm left with grams at the very end. 2.11 grams of silver bromide. There's your titration, which is essentially stoichiometry. And that is a place to stop.